Scott, thank you for uh, inviting Otoy. And hopefully a lot of you guys saw the um, demos outside um, showing some of our work related to light fields and VR. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about our company. Um, you know, when, uh, when I and my co-founder started this, you know, we had a passion that was driven a lot by Star Trek, and in particular the holodeck. Um, and that was for this magical uh, experience that, you know, Star Trek sort of laid out for us um, uh, basically 30 years ago. And I wanted to see that happen. And as a company, we've been building what we think are important pieces of the tool chain for artists and content creators um, and even publishers to sort of tap into that. And, uh, and so, you know, at Otoy, we sort of say we're, we're building this digital holographic content publishing pipeline. And, you know, we have some great partners like Warner Brothers. The way we define a digital hologram, I mean, uh, from a technical perspective, is it includes um, light fields. Um, it includes depth information, so you know where each ray in a light field is coming from. It includes all the relighting information that you've been seeing in these other, um, you know, sort of capture methods. And it also includes the ability to really um, semantically understand a scene in an object and reproject it and dynamically move it, just like a video game. Uh, that's what you would need to build the holodeck. Now, on the way towards that goal, um, what happened was something that was really interesting. You know, we figured, all right, somebody's going to build a light field display. And you saw that um, with Mark's presentation with the spinning mirror. That truly is a, a light field display. Um, but if you're thinking about billions of people experiencing something immersive, um, you don't need to build a billion holodecks. I mean, there's going to be billions of phones. And I think, you know, Oculus really broke some amazing ground when they really brought together that concept. Facebook bought them. And now we have both Google and Oculus and, and others in Facebook building these very inexpensive VR devices out of mobile phones. And that is a really amazing option for us to, to be tapping into. And that's also something that could be used for mixed reality and augmented reality. So when I imagine how this is all going to look and feel, um, this is pretty much what, what I have in mind. This is with our render. This is um, one of the tools that we've been creating and building. And this is rendered on a GPU. In fact, it's rendered on a desktop. And it's four minutes of frame. And now with a modern GPU, this is uh, two years ago, it's, it's basically one minute of frame. I can render this on my laptop at 1080p. And this is great for making films, but it's even better for rendering holographic immersive content. And so we've been sort of taking this kind of technology and figuring this is Everything in here, by the way, is synthetic. There's not a single thing that was captured as a photograph. It's all done in 3D Studio Max, and it's all rendered with, um, with our GPU render, Octane. And, uh, and I think that's a pretty good representation of how to approach building a realistic world. Um, there's way more detail in this than you could ever fit inside a video game engine. In fact, when you're in the 3D Studio Max viewport, unless it's our render, if you're just trying to render it in the Max viewport, you'd see the truck and the road, nothing else, because it's just too much detail. And, uh, and that's great for worlds and, and objects and, and the like, you know, as far as rendering. And, and we've been working on that piece for artists for a while now. Similarly, we've also been thinking about how do, how do we get people uh, that look completely real into this pipeline. And, you know, fortunately, thanks to the breakthroughs that uh, Paul and, and, and Tim Hawkins had made at ICT, we had an option. And we commercialized, Otwa commercialized um, the light stage technology. And in the end, uh, you know, a few years down the line, you know, we were able to sort of see these amazing results out of it. I mean, there's not a single film today that has a major uh, visual effects cue with, with, with a human character that isn't using light stage. And so you can see that it's used not just for recreating people. It can also be morphed into things like, uh, you know, the Avatar characters or Hulk. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of value in the data that's coming out of light stage. If you, you've seen some of the capture devices before, there's many iterations. We've got one in Burbank. We're building smaller and smaller versions of it until it becomes a portable device. Um, I think that there is one really interesting um, aspect of light stage beyond just capturing the normals. It's this. It's basically being able to fully relight an object. We have so much information that's coming from not just multiple cameras like a light field, but just multiple ways that lights are bouncing off of the surface. And with that, we can reproject uh, images like this. And that's, this entire face is being lit by the light probe. That's very powerful. Um, and we've been thinking about ways that we want to take things further. As, as Mark was saying, you know, when you get really close to a face, um, details matter. And so this is some of the newer light stage stuff from maybe 18 months ago. And obviously, you know, it's, it's also, by the way, rendering in our renderer um, nearly instantly. You know, we've been very focused on delivering this kind of quality and content to everyone. And to that end, you know, we've been working on putting together some assets, um, you know, it's sort of a database for people to build off of 
Um, but there's still more work to be done. And in particular, I think what people really want to see out of really good capture is faces in motion with this kind of detail. And we've been working on that too, and we've made some pretty good progress. This is um, from about two or three years ago, and if you see this, uh, basically this is you know, really close to the skin, and this is all something that we can bring into Octane, and it's a CG um, object at that point. And it's really exciting to sort of get to that point. I mean, what we want to do is make this cheaper, and Paul's actually made some pretty cool uh, breakthroughs in that, in that area, and we've commercialized that. So one of these is making Light Siege portable, enough that it can be brought to the President of the United States and it can be used to capture um, a person of interest, um, like, like the President or anything that would go into the Smithsonian. And we've been thinking about other ways that this could be applied to capturing surfaces. Um, and this is a test we did with a very cheap and portable light stage system for capturing the ground and trees. Similarly, uh, object capture and um, surface reflection capture. This is also um, something that you can download and try in Octane. And then finally, you know, the, the, the area that I think is, is probably a, a complex problem is, is environments. You know, really, where anything is, is possible in there. And that's where this, uh, this, this sort of simple rig came in pretty handy. And it gave us the ability to sort of tackle um, another layer of the problem, which was to get, you know, the most complex environments we could imagine from the real world into VR uh, or AR. And this is essentially the, another uh, scene that we, you can check out in the um, demo that we've been getting to work on the vibe of the contraption. But it doesn't matter how complex the scene is, uh, how, much, how many bounces of light there is. It's all sort of encapsulated there. And all of these things get the real world into a pipeline that we think is, um, is kind of necessary for sort of this rectification process into a data set that we can then compress and stream, um, which is critically important if you're going to be targeting mobile devices. And we do see the future of immersive computing being driven by mobile devices that are not tethered, um, that don't need a high-end PC. And, um, and so that there is this, this really wonderful convergence where all these things are kind of happening in the right way for us to, to leverage. Um, and so we put some of this into practice already, and we've had some really interesting results from that. Um, one of the very first people that really got to see a lot of this technology and how we applied it to VR um, was John Carmack. And Something that Otoy did a test render for this, and they actually added a feature to their Octane renderer that builds stereo panoramas in this absolutely peak quality for Gear VR version, where it uses our cube map format for the overlay shaders, and it's perfectly sampled, perfectly set up, and those are literally the best images I have ever seen through any VR headset anywhere. There are they have, if you've seen some of Otoy's work, they have some, uh, the things that show off ray tracing, semi-transparent stuff, reflections, ambient, uh, you know, good global illumination. And they've got some, like a kitchen scene and a bedroom scene. And I see people that will just sit there and they're like, I could stay in this kitchen for hours just looking at how high quality the, the renderings are. But what's important about this is this is sort of our benchmark. So we can say with this exact display, we can hit this level of fidelity that is incredibly good. So we can start approaching that with our real-time rendering and you know, eventually be able to be doing that level of quality both for captured things in the more general form with light fields. And I should also mention that uh, when I saw Otoy's light field work, I went into it, as with so many things, you know, the secret to, to happiness is reasonable expectations. You know, I went in with, I had seen some lumographs and light field work before that was generally kind of a blurry mess. It was the sort of thing where you look at this and it's like, okay, it's neat that you can rotate it around and view it from different things. And you can sort of see the future in it, but you're not actually analyzing the quality of the thing in front of you. So I was pleasantly surprised by the light field demos where, you know, what I saw was just where you had a, like a picture window that you could look through, but it was captured, well, it wasn't captured, it was synthetically rendered, but you could move around that, and I was surprised by how good it looked. So the, there's a lot of interesting things that he brought up in, in, in that uh, presentation. This was from a year ago, so he was talking about things that, you know, we, we, you know, we were way further back in the pipeline. I mean, we only had synthetic light field renders, which um, I'll be showing you in a little bit. And of course, now that you know, we've shown you sort of the pipeline for captured stuff, and a lot of that work actually was was sort of inspired by John. And you know, there's there's a lot of um, of reasons why you want both, right? Why you want to be able to render things synthetically and capture the real world, and pretty much just like in Photoshop, just mix them together. 
and because some things are just very hard to um, to tractably capture in the way you want. You know, if you want to get you know glint and lighting just the right way in a forest in in uh, you know South America, well, you know this can be done in two minutes in Octane. And similarly, as we've started to roll out Octane for VR purposes, we've seen some really amazing content being generated and built. Um, you know, this is the scene that Carmack was talking about, the kitchen scene, um, that we, you know, you can get a Gear VR today and you can see all of these images in Oculus 360 photos. We've been working with them to sort of bring 3D and these other dimensions, these stereo cube maps to Gear VR. And it's an important first step. But what Carmack was referring to as far as the, um, you know, this sort of holographic effect, you know, the picture window, that kitchen scene, when we render it synthetically, um, looks like this. And this is something that can play back on any mobile device. And it's compressed 1,000 to 1 to 10,000 to 1. And it includes everything I was referring to before. It doesn't just include all the possible planoptic viewpoints. It includes scene information. All the data that you have in the original Octane scene file is there. Similarly, when we bring in something from the real world through light stage capture, it's also there. And we can mix those together. And it's this magical holographic reality toolbox. Um, there's one important piece that we did develop uh, over the last year. And that's the player. And the player is now in the Gear VR store. Um, it's being used in two interesting ways. One is uh, publishers like Warner Brothers will be publishing content through it. Um, we're going to allow you to just white label it and reskin it and republish an app with, with the um, core, uh, core framework. It's all written in Lua, pure Lua. And it also is something that we, um, we've used for uh, user-generated content. And we initially thought, well, people are going to author this in Lua. And then we realized, no, what people really want is to author this in Max or Maya and not think about coding or scripting. And I think there is a lot of value to that. So if you look at this, um, this screenshot, this is Octane with all the different pieces that we exposed in script, in the, uh, in the node editor, in the graph, and we can keep adding to those and making it so that you can create pretty high-end content, same as the stuff we're doing for Warner Brothers and other studios, um, right within the R pipeline. And you don't have to go and you know, get a game engine. Um, in that pipeline, you have things like compositing layers, and that actually makes a big difference in VR. So that's the truck scene that I showed at the beginning um, inside of the Gear VR, and there's one layer for the background, another layer that's taking just the motion pieces, and there's a third layer that has the shadow elements, and those can all be brought together. You can relight things, and there's a lot of, of useful, um, useful stuff there, and you can really treat it as if it were Photoshop layers, except it's in holographic space. Um, to sort of put this to the test, in April, we did partner with Oculus, and we let everyone in the world try Octane VR with the very first version of these tools. And we didn't know what we would get out of it, um, but we ended up getting hundreds of amazing submissions. And we let people create this, publish it to the website. We had people that are excited about it on social media. And I'm just going to show one of these scenes. And this is one of the, um, this is the third place winner in June. I mean, there's, they're all really good. Um, but this one's an interesting scene in particular because it looks, it looks pretty real. Um, you, you can download it on the Gear VR app, and I'll tell you right now, it's not real. It's all just you know, octane. But it's based on a real place. It's based on, a, on um, uh, you know, a garden in Tokyo that looks just like this. And on our forums, when the uh, user was sort of describing how he did it, I was really surprised. I, I thought, you know, I wasn't sure what went into this, um, into this work, but it was really interesting to sort of see that, um, that workflow and sort of how our tools fit into that and where we could help improve this uh, as time went on. So these are all synthetic renders. Um, obviously, when you're flying above the, um, that path, it's still synthetic. Um, but where it gets interesting is where you start to see how this was, content was acquired. And there are some photos that were taken of leaves, of, um, of gravel, and then this is all sort of blended together in Octane. And you end up with these really high quality um, photo, you know, photogrammic textures. And what we want to do is make it so that you don't have to actually worry about the gloss on the wood. You can kind of capture that as well. And so that's why some of the earlier uh, slides showing you know, material capture and surface capture are really important. That will make this workflow even faster. Although I will point out that this was done in, a, you know, in this, this, this artist's spare time. He works at Capcom. And he did this over the, his, uh, his spare weekends. And, um, and so as we look at what we want to add to this publishing pipeline, uh, this is the um, first place winner for the month before. Um, and it's this really nice toy, toy box scene. Uh, we want to make it so that you can, at the very least, control other dimensions besides uh, what I showed before with the um, uh, you know, viewpoint reprojection. We wanted to make it so that lighting layers are implicitly stored in there. This renders for free in Octane. And we can use this to recreate the effects you see in the Netflix app, or the Oculus Cinema app, or the you know, Twitch app, where you can basically take any surface and project um, you know, video onto it. And that's something that is of value. And then you mix that with some of the other pieces that we know are, are important, where you can actually move through the scene 
and have that be something that's you know, designed not just from the camera uh, system that the artist designs, but just from walking through it, you get a really powerful effect. So obviously I don't have a VR device where you can walk through the scene um, you know, that I can share with all of you, but I can show you what that looks like and how different that is from just looking at that still image. And that's the effects you get um, from adding all these dimensions. And we want, we want this to be used you know, across the spectrum from people that are hobbyists, uh, professional artists, and I think the only way to really make sure this all works is to kind of create content ourselves, not just for partners like Warner's and other studios, but just original content where we push the envelope as far as we can. And um, I've been working with a good friend of mine for 15 years. Uh, he's helped actually improve Octane a lot. And he has this passion project called Keloid. And it's all you know, rendered in Octane um, on the GPU. And we started to put these scenes out on the Gear VR. Um, and they're very ambitious scenes. I and mean, the entire thing is basically computer generated, and you'll see the snapshots of these scenes on the Gear VR still images, but you can see sort of how much we want to add in terms of motion and dynamism uh, in, this, uh, in this pipeline. And there's some magical pieces that come together when you see scenes like this where you can move through them. And I'm also really paying attention to how somebody that's this good as a cinematographer um, composes his scenes and what he does with the tools that we give him in Octane VR. Um, and so there's, that's sort of a high-level overview of the authoring and the, and the, um, uh, and the art tools that we have. Um, for people that are more technically oriented, that are interested in what existing on-ramps there are to this pipeline, um, I want to sort of share a little bit about the roadmap that we have in the next uh, 12 months. So we're about to put out a new version of Octane. Uh, we're dropping the alpha build probably in a few weeks. And it'll add some really important pieces, um, such as volumetrics, participating media. These are things that are very hard to render um, we also are working on capturing those very same things, although you, you can procedurally generate a lot of these things really nicely. And that means that we can then have an easier path towards integration in tools like Houdini. We have 24 plugins. It's more than I think any other um, 3D render out there. And it all, you know, they all pretty much look the same. They even have an interchange format. So you can take stuff from Houdini and bring it into Blender. Or we have an Unreal Engine plugin, bring it into Unreal or Photoshop or After Effects, or Nuke, or anything. So there's, there's a lot of this, this cross-pollination where no matter what your tool of choice is, you have an option to really touch this pipeline. And we're adding um, all the pieces that you've seen up to this point, whether it's rendering sort of in volumetric space or capturing from the real world. All these things are meant to be very easy to use. And you'll even have those pieces that allow you to do interactive elements, um, like what, you know, probably to the point where you can do a lot of cinematic Dragon's Lair style or Blu-ray menu system kind of stuff all in VR space, and it'll look really good. Um, there, there are some hard problems, though, that we have to solve uh, to make this thing really practical when you're talking about rendering uh, volumes that are this big, that, that are, you can walk through, like, um, you know, like the Batcave um, or that far scene. And so f to that end, while Octane is incredibly fast at 2K or 4K or even 8K on a single or multiple GPUs, um, you kind of want to have thousands of GPUs when you're rendering 16 square kilometers. And, that's why we built in, right into the plugins, um, the ability for you to sync with the cloud. And then the cloud service on org.oto.com will, will basically grab your scene and render out whatever you want. It could be video, it could be animations, it could be lighting layers. You can specify you know, X number of dimensions, and it'll take care of all of that for you. And more importantly, it'll also um, create multiple versions of these things that can either be downloaded or streamed live, um, not just to our app, but also into a web page, even with JavaScript. And that gets tricky because on, in certain cases, you know, for the Gear VR, it's got to be stereo QMAP video. Um, with position tracking, then we can do something that's closer to a light field or a holographic volume. And we want to support everything. So basically, we look at it as printing to different uh, you know, formats or supporting different resolutions of video. And, um, and there is a value to having you know, thousands of GPUs on the cloud. We're, building, we're sourcing that with multiple providers, including um, having us uh, support some data centers, especially in LA, where there's a lot of production work. And the, all these things combined really give you a solid platform for publishing from the web to mobile to desktops, and more importantly, to VR devices and soon AR devices, which we think are going to be even more challenging. Because there, you're going to have to mix what you're seeing in, in you know, sort of volumetric synthetic space with what's coming in from the real world. And I think there's two approaches. There's the Magic Leap or um, Microsoft HoloLens approach, which is to just give you this pass-through effect. And then there's something that I think is going to be even more widely adopted, where you just have a, an array of cameras on the back of the phone that just give you this, this, um, this data already and generate that and mix that inside of the uh, VR uh, view that you have. And you can already do this and play with this 
um, in the uh, Oculus Gear VR. It has a pass through lens. It's always improving. Um, and I think that the last bit that we need to think about and that we're trying to solve, um, and it's probably one of the hardest pieces, is what about when you want to move an object? So let's say you have a light field and you have a, or you have a holographic um, you know, representation of this with all the possible lighting conditions. Um, you know, that's what happens if you deform it or it changes. And that's where you almost have to go back a step to, um, to path tracing or ray tracing. And so we built a separate engine from Octane. It, they're, they're, it shares a lot of its code, but it's called Brigade. And we initially um, were planning to, and we still are, to basically have it be a previs tool on the cloud where once you've you know, synchronized your scene with the cloud, we can throw 20 GPUs at this and we can give you back a perfectly ray traced scene, totally dynamic, nothing is baked, it's all live, and it's awesome. And it uses exactly the same material and production pipeline that we've already given you uh, with all these plugins. Um, but there's another layer that, that, that this also affects, which is our Orbex viewer app. As we get to more advanced mobile GPUs that support Vulkan, or even in the case of Project Tango, CUDA, we can bring pieces of Brigade um, into the mobile app, even you know, drive that from Lua, and, um, and use that to be able to dynamically move these objects around and fill in those patches. Um, I think that needs to happen. At that point, then you can actually take something like the Unreal Engine or Unity and just replace OpenGL with this pipeline. And I think that has a huge amount of value. That's one of the reasons why we're developing an Unreal Engine plugin, because we have that in mind in the final step. And we're looking at it from, maybe you don't need that. Maybe you just want to publish to our app or you know, take our library and republish your own uh, white label version of it. Or you want to integrate this in some other platform that we don't know about. And Unreal is a good starting point. The web's another. And we'll probably look at things like Unity as well. Um, I want to sort of close out um, you know, my piece of the presentation with just sort of my thoughts on where things are heading. Um, I update this pretty much every time I give one of these talks. And I sort of break this down into what I think is going to happen in three months, six months, a year, two years. And I think right now, uh, certainly for the remainder of this year and into next, um, you have two major players. You have basically Facebook and you have Google. Um, and Facebook obviously is, is intimately tied to Samsung and the Gear VR. I mean, they're basically, it's, it's a vertical. Um, and you have Google that's going almost the opposite direction. They're giving away cardboard. They're shipping it with the New York Times. It's for, it works on your iPhone. And, um, and between the two of them, you're going to get a lot of coverage um, even this year. You know, this, it, and I think as you go into next year, um, I think Samsung, Facebook, and Oculus, and Google are going to make serious plays behind mobile VR. Um, and I think that's going to get into millions, if not tens of millions of people's hands. And it's going to be a pretty good experience. I mean, the Gear VR is absolutely awesome. Um, if you guys saw our demo outside, we actually added position tracking to the Gear VR. And it kind of works. Like, we've only worked on this thing for about 10 days, and it's already looking pretty good. Um, show of hands, who tried it? Any, a lot. Did you guys like it? Cool. Um, <laughs> And so there's, 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 a, there's definitely more that can be done in the mobile space. I don't think that, that, that desktops are the only way you're going to get high-end content with position tracking. I absolutely believe that you're going to get to the point where you know, mobile devices will be able to, to deliver that. And you see that direction really happening um, very quickly with, with um, things like Vulkan going into the next version of Android. Uh, NVIDIA and Apple both pushing the envelopes of what G mobile GPUs can do. I mean, that iPad Pro is faster than the... MacBook Pro that I have in my, um, you know, in, in my bag that has an NVIDIA 650M in it. It's crazy. And the Shield is the same way. Um, so I think that there's, um, there, there is going to be, though, a huge market for people that are PC gamers or PlayStation 4 users that just want to have VR. And you know, there's 22 and a half million PS4s, maybe more by now. Uh, there's obviously, I don't know, something like 120 million Steam users. That's a huge market. And those guys are hardcore gamers for the most part. And I think that Oculus and, and you know, Valve and HTC are right to sort of you know, work and address that. Um, and that will happen next year. I mean, we'll see how that plays out. I don't think it's going to be the same size as what you'll get on, on a mobile device, but it's going to be a significant um, share of the market that probably gaming will, you know, will thrive on. Um, I do think that you're gonna, there's opportunities for untethered VR on the mobile side of things. And then as we sort of look beyond that to, you know, beyond sort of next year into 2017, 2018, that's where things get pretty interesting. I also think that's where you're going to get really serious AR efforts. I mean, I think HoloLens is a good first step. That's coming out next year. But, you know, what I'm most interested in is something like Magic Leap. And Magic Leap almost brings us full circle, where I I've been waiting for light-filled displays of some sort to come to market. And if these guys are building it and these guys are shipping it, and it's going to be based on, you know, Android, where we can, you know, stream in, uh, you know, our app, our content. I mean, we have all this light-filled content. We can't really fully render it without a light-filled display. 
that's amazing. And you know, we want to support that if we can. Um, and then I also think you're going to see sort of the, on the opposite side, you're just going to see this kind of content, immersive content, possibly light filled content, holographic content, being embedded even outside of um, immersive computing platforms. And you see that already with um, you know, 360 YouTube videos, Facebook adding 360 videos into the timeline is really your one step away from having just a window, as we showed it, uh, on both of those platforms into this kind of world and this kind of space. And then there'll be a button that goes the equivalent of, you know, instead of going to full screen mode, you just put on the device and you're in that world. Um, and then the market itself is, is definitely, you know, it looks like it'll be big. I mean, this is Digit Capital. I mean, magically sort of retweeted this. I, I think it's probably accurate. I think there's going to be an enormous, um, I mean, this is a paradigm shift. I think you're just not going to have a desktop and a TV and a phone and even a movie theater. You're going to have one thing beamed into your eyes that's going to be better than all of them. The cloud will play a factor in it. New content and new pipelines need to be created to support it. And we want to be prepared. That's one of the reasons why we're working so hard on all of these problems. Um, so I think I have a few minutes left for questions. Um, if, uh, if you guys have any, I'd be happy to answer them and um, shed any light on what you guys have just seen. Thank you very much. <laughs>